Well, I thought what we'd do is maybe just talk a little bit about how drives work, just kind of lay down that template. I'm going to go really fast sure. through the portions that maybe are not quite as interesting, and then for the parts that you're more interested in or you may have some dialogue about, I'll slow down. That's what I'll do for the sake of making this slide show look a little bit better. A few of these slides I, I, I integrated into this PowerPoint yesterday, and some of them kind of overlapped with some of the, the verbiage. Is that coming through okay on the video? Thumbs up. Just a little bit of background. We're, we're a big company, $5 billion, been around for over 100 years. It was interesting. We celebrated our 100-year anniversary not too long ago, and I got a really nice hardcover book with Mr. Yasakawa-san. Circa 1920 in the images. Yeah, it was pretty wild to actually reading the history. But this is a timeline, and, and the key point of this timeline is just to show you that Yaskawa has developed the world's first transistorized inverter in 1971, the world's first um, servo actually prior to that in 60, and then in 74, flux vector technology, IGBT, which is a particular type of semiconductor, now very common, of course. And then out on the line after the merger between Louis Alice Magnatech and Iskawa in 01, the world's first three-level topology drive. Um, and I can comment on that, but for your applications, I'm not sure that it's all that relevant because that's more of a process drive. This would be where you're running a motor control center in a like a UL class environment and your motors are a thousand feet away where the explosions could happen. So you, gotcha. it, so you want to take the drive out of the UL class environment and run long conductors, for example. The G7 is a great solution for that. We are a global company. We do manufacture here in the United States, which has really helped us with the supply chain problems because candidly with our parts and ability to build out and, and inventory here, granted we're still subject to the fits and the struggles with global supply. However, we do manufacture in the US. We manufacture in Europe, we manufacture in Asia. Uh, so we maintain kind of three, I guess, businesses in those geographic vicinities. Focusing in on the Americas gives you an idea of where our facilities are, robotics in Ohio, the inverter plant in Buffalo Grove, along with Motion and Servo. Waukegan, Illinois is our headquarters and support. Um, we do have 24 hour a day, seven day, 24 hour a day, seven day technical support available out of Waukegan, Illinois. And then Oak Creek is another manufacturing facility. Free where, support. Yeah, it's, it's free support. We don't, we don't require a, a contract or a, a, a particular account number to bill against or, yeah, you call us and, and you will get an engineer. You know, sometimes it may take a little bit of time if they're real busy, but we'll get you a guy. Um, this is a historic view of the Escal product line, looking back at the 1000 series. And, and what you see here is, is a very broad, obviously scaled out product line. On the left hand side is flexibility and performance on the vertical axis, and then the scale in terms of power ratings on the horizontal. The key product for us to focus in on would be like the V1000, which would be more akin to like, is it PowerFlex 525s, I assume? Primarily, or 527s, yeah, yeah, yeah. 525s? Yeah. Which one is it? Do you the know offhand? 525s, I believe. 525s, okay. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. So if we're talking about a 525, obviously the scale of that product would be in that green V1000, J1000. And then I think I've got a slide here. Yeah, this, this transition point, it's kind of subtle. The GA500 kind of assumed the place of the B1000 product there. And you'll notice the horsepower bumped out nicely. Again, for you, you're in the five and down range. doesn't matter too much. But the V1000 is a product that we've had for over a decade, tried, true, very reliable. Uses the same exact SIEN cards uh, that uh, Neff is, is going to be stocking, and, um, and it's a fully capable inverter in your horsepower range as an alternative. And we build these today, they're a current product, so we can get you two different options, V1000 or GA500, which will be the point of our conversation today, but just kind of keep that in mind. The other thing that I'd say about the V1000 is that in some of your distributed control, if you did need a drive that was mounted in a, in a more robust enclosure type, has that ever happened before, Matt? Where Not in particular, but... Okay. okay. 
if, in other words, if you didn't have a, a cabinet or a box that was distributed and you just want to drive on, you know, right by the motor, we do have a V1000 variant called a 4X. And the advantage of the 4X is it's just a more robust IP66 style enclosure, which is capable of running in a dusty, dirty, even wet environment if for some reason there'd be moisture you know, exposure. So just know that that V1000 line is out there, it's current, and it supports the same type of integration tools with RS Logix as the GA500. So you've got a common hardware platform with the SIEM cards, and then you've got just different architecture drives that you can choose from. And you're saying there's a 4X level for more of a remote kind of standalone model? You got it. Yep. Yes, sir. And then this is just going to transition you through a few other slides. Um, and just, again, kind of back to how drives work. Again, taking, taking the lens out a little bit, looking at AC drives as a business, as a product. Obviously, you don't need thermal overload relays when you apply a drive to a motor. I assume you knew that. Um, in some cases, if you were to run multiple drive, multiple motors rather off of one drive, in that case, then you would definitely need thermal overload protection. Do you ever have that kind of scenario come up at all, man, or is that not really? No, but that, that brings up a curious question, so how about that? Good. <laughs> Do you, do you want go ahead and ask? I mean, uh, well, I, it's I just, just us. <laughs> and, 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 uh, I, as yeah. far as maybe some of our situations, I'm curious about that. Oh, I, I would have to ask. Saying. Yeah, you'd have to ask around. A yeah, bit. I have yeah. to ask around a little bit on some gotcha. of our other installations, but um, sure. Yeah. Well, that's outstanding. Yeah, I'd love to, again, get with Andrew when that type of topic comes up, and I'd be happy to come on down and, and visit with your team, excuse me, and talk about that. But yeah, multi-motor applications, you know, there, there are many cases where you've got all the sections of a particular machine operating at one speed. And as, as a matter of fact, it's, a, and it's an advantage to keep them all synchronized and kind of locked on to the same frequency and the same voltage and the same exact power supply. Yeah. Uh, so this can be done. There also is the ability to sectionalize drive systems. It's a whole different product line than GA500 and we don't really have time to go into that today, but when the opportunity comes, just get with, get with Andrew and Neff and, and we'll help you with that. But what we can do by sectionalizing drives, we can have very precise control, section to section, um, actually ratio control. Um, so it's kind of an electronic gearing type of system where if you need a very precise closed loop encoder style feedback on a conveyor section, and then the ability to adjust the, the ratio up and down uh, between those sections. Um, again, it would be the same as, as if the equipment was mechanically driven off of the same exact line shaft. So it's a real high level of performance that I'm speaking to. But again, if that type of need were to ever come up, certainly NEF power can help you with it. Yeah, that, that's actually quite interesting because that's kind of what we do in certain scenarios. Yeah. Now it's a little bit more technically and from a cost standpoint involved because now you're talking about encoders mounted on motors, right? Much like in the servo motion control world where you have to have some type of Yeah, but you're reducing it down to one drive though too, right? Yeah, you could have, well, in, in the case that I'm speaking of, actually you would need separate drives. Yeah, I kind of skewed from okay. the multi-motor to uh, the... So if you had, let's for example say, yeah. well, one of our projects we just had 100 and, uh, 160 linear feet of conveyor that was a single trunk line that we sorted off of and we encode that so that we know our package position yeah. as it's going down but there's three three or four drives running that section so technically I could run one drive since they're all on the same speed Yes. And you could have, we could have encoded that off of the motors themselves? In, in that case, where all of the motors are always going to be operating at the same time, <coughs> and when they are operating, excuse me, they'll only be operating at one speed, in that case, then the short answer to your question is yes, one drive for each of these four motors in this case, with separate thermal overload relays distributed out, to each one of the motor circuits 
would certainly apply. Hmm. The, 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 the only downside of that is when the drive is running, all four motors have to be running unless you had some type of output, output contactor to isolate a particular motor from the drive's output power supply. Does that make sense? Yep. So you could get around what I just said, but if they're hardwired together and, and, and RS logic says run, all four motors are lit and running at the same exact speed at the same exact time with their own individualized thermal overload protection. So it would save you the cost of having to buy four separate drives, but rather just one higher horsepower, higher capacity inverter. That, that would be the advantage. And with the GA500, we've got the scale. We can push all the way up to, even if you had four, five, uh, five horsepower drives, some of your bigger you know, applications, um, you know, that's a 25, 30 horsepower application, we're golden there. And that's a, that's a nice advantage with this product line versus where you're at today because uh, you're limited there to about 20, 25 horsepower with, with some of those yeah, power I those, I think those three, three or four motors are three horsepower or something. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, and I'm, I'm kind of speaking to sure, sure. Bigger, on the bigger side of things. The, the GA500 offers you a broad scale going up to 40 horsepower at 460 volt and 30 horsepower at 230 volt. Okay. But yeah, good, good stuff. So, um, and this is just an overview of how drives work. I, I like this schematic. It, it really helps to uh, uh, practically understand the physics. Have you seen this before, Matt? No. Do you mind if I stand up? Or am I going to mess that up too badly? I'm, I'm giving you fair warning. Thank you. <laughs> so um, what, what we have here is if I could superimpose, if I could take out a marker and just draw on this. <laughs> you can draw on those walls. I can draw on those walls, yeah. seriously? Yeah. Okay. That's that will, are you okay if I move a little bit? Um, because it helps me to kind of explain how inverters work. And this is not going to be a long dissertation no, no to here and back, but it, it's helpful to understand that technically how the drive works is you have three phase incoming power, which, which would look like this. And the three phase incoming power can be 400 volt class or 200 volt class. Okay, and for, you know, do you do any export work? Do you send equipment to Europe or Asia? Perhaps? Not in particular, no. Okay. Um, we went to Montreal, but yeah. okay. it's, it's not really. We did some Canada stuff. Yeah, yeah. Canada, but. Yeah. So whether it's 50 or 60 hertz or any of these voltage classes, it, when you get into the Canadian market, there there is 575 volt or 600 volt. Yeah, 600 volt. Yeah, which would actually move us. We, we do have product that covers that requirement, but it would move us from GA500 to a different platform. Again, just get with Andrew, we can help you. But um, what happens with the three phase incoming power is it comes into a diode section, which you see schematically laid out much better than my terrible artwork here. But I'm kind of emulating this circuit by what I'm going to draw up here. So three phase comes in into the uh, diode section, and the diodes are, are essentially just a unidirectional switch. So they only allow the voltage to pass into the DC bus at the peak of the sinusoid. Okay, kind of extend this out a little bit. And then I've got my DC bus, and I come into the transistor section, which again, you see much, much better uh, drawn out for you on the schematic, and then we go out to the electric motor from the transistors. But what happens in the guts of the drive is the magnitude of that DC bus voltage is actually uh, the DC bus voltage is equal to the square root of 2 times AC line voltage. So to solve for the voltage, that's why if you look on your drives at the DC bus voltage, you'll see a value of, it's 1.414 is the square is the square root of 2 times, we'll say, 460 volt, which would then solve for about 690 volts DC, and about half that at 200 volts. Okay, so the capacitors are taking this 690 volts, and their job is to smooth out the DC 
so that there's no commutation ripple as I drew it out here. So these caps provide a very important job of smoothing out the direct current as it's presented to the transistors. And then what the transistors do, kind of continuing our circuit out to the motor, is they take the direct current and they chop it up. And they chop it up positive and negative. And the magnitude of the pulse widths is always equal to the DC bus voltage. So the peak right here is always equal to 690 volts. But the transistors are able to vary the amount of on time, thereby pulse width modulating yep. out to the electric motor. Okay. And so this, this is then fed into the electric motor. And the important thing to understand here is um, if we look at frequency, for example, and we want to solve for RPM. Are your motors mainly 1800 RPM motors that you get from the conveyor supplier? 1800 synchronous speed? Typically, yeah. Okay, yeah. So if their synchronous speed is 1800 RPM, that means they are four pole induction motors. So 120 times 60 hertz line power is 7200 divided by the number of pole groupings in the electric motor, in your case, four poles solves for 1800 RPM. Gotcha. So if I modulate frequency from 60 to 30, then my top line number goes from 7200 down to 3600 divided by 4, puts me at 900 RPM output. Modulating frequency, and, and that's essentially what I did here. This is 60 hertz. And notice the time component here, time 1, obviously, Two. Obviously, time one is greater than time two, right? The amount of turn off time here, time one, is greater than there's practically no turn off time here. So that's how we achieve 60 hertz versus 30 hertz by varying the turn on, turn off time. But you'll notice also that I varied the voltage as well. And the reason for that is very important to understand because in, in electric motors, you may, you may recall this from school. <laughs> Does that ring a bell? You know right. what that, that means? Yeah, that's Ohm's law, of course. Yep. Well, in, in a circuit, <clears throat> current is I, and we want current to be constant because let's say we have a three horsepower motor at uh, 1750 rated RPM. And that motor is at 460 volt connected, 460, 460 volts. And the full load amps on it are, um, well, let's just say two. Nah, it'd be a little higher than that. We'll go with uh, four amps. A four amp motor, okay? So if I has to be constant in my Ohm's law formula here, right? That means no matter what frequency I'm operating at, I have to maintain 4 amps because current is proportional to torque. Very important concept. You need X amount of torque on that conveyor and that's a constant value no matter what velocity you're moving product down the line. You gotta have, in this case, three times three foot-pounds of torque per horsepower is nine foot-pounds of torque. Yeah. So that value is fixed, okay? But what happens in the, in the electric motor, in the guts of the motor, in the winding system and in the rotor, is you will see a reduction in the amount of, actually because it's an inductive load, it really is a pure resistive load. So you need to substitute this value here. Stop using my finger and use the eraser. This is really cool writing on the wall. I feel like a kid. <laughs> you can see I just got just gonna keep, keep I'm just gonna keep going. I'm gonna be over by you in no time yet. You got that wall too if you need it, so <laughs> but it's actually impedance. Yeah, a function of resistance and inductance to equal impedance. And what happens in the guts of the electric motor is that as my frequency goes down. What do you think happens to impedance? I always ask that question of engineers and the technology. It actually goes down. Oh, does it? And if you think about it intuitively, Matt, it makes sense. Think about it this way. 
if I've got 60 hertz, you know, kind of this, going through the winding of the motor, through the stator winding and the iron of the motor, the stator iron and the rotor and the rotor cage, if I've got 60 hertz going through that circuit versus 30 hertz, it makes more sense that there'd be more resistance to 60 than 30 going through the resistance and the impedance that is in the electric motor. And so don't, don't feel bad about answering yeah. that. I, I'm serious, I'm in front of engineers that, you know, many large companies with great double E's who, you know, really know their stuff, and I'll ask the same question, I'll be like, um, yeah, I, I think it actually would be more resistance the lower you go, so <laughs> it's very common. Uh, but yeah, in fact, it's lower. So in other words, as my frequency goes down, my impedance goes down, as a matter of fact, you can substitute impedance oh, that, that's for frequency. It's not, the system's not as hot, so. Yeah. Okay. So what happens is my frequency goes down, my I has to be constant, therefore at a direct ratio to my frequency change, my pulse width modulating turn on time must change. So that's why at this particular output of 30 hertz, we'll say this is 30 hertz, right here. My output voltage goes from, at full speed, it's 460 over 60. But at 30 hertz, I'm at 230. And these two values are equal. That way my motor circuit current stays constant. Okay. So that's the physics for the day. I promise no more. Yeah, no, I, I and, know that's and, and why this has so much utility for you, and I'm glad to know that I do too. <laughs> um, we share that. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're kindred spirits. Um, the, the thing about, about this that is so important, practically speaking, is in adjustable speed drives, you'll see a lot of um, parameters associated with volts per hertz ratios, volts per hertz curves, over excitation, under excitation. And actually there's a few slides in here that speak to that. This is just an image of a diode, image of a capacitor, image of a pre-charge circuit, which I'm not going to get into on your model drives because they're, it's not that important. Um, this is a good, or a good uh, uh, viewing to see. And what it is, is it's a Typical Yaskawa drive control wiring. This would be if you use digital inputs, digital outputs, analog inputs, analog outputs. This would be what your schema would look like. Yeah. Now, of course, today, we'd slap an Ethernet card onto the front end of the yeah. drive, and you wouldn't have all those multi, what we call multifunction digital inputs on the left. All the inputs are on the left, just like your power supply is on the left there. Your digital multifunction inputs are S1 through S7. Your analog inputs or frequency references can come from a signal generator, a 4 to 20, a 0 to 10, a pressure transducer, any of these devices would then feed on the input side, the left side of the drive. And on the output side, you've got your motor, obviously three phase on your T terminals. And there's an analog output that you can pick up for any kind of metering if you wanted to do that. You can monitor via Ethernet the particular registers to pick up frequency, torque, whatever you want to, back to your HMI or your controller. And then there's actually some hard contacts built into the drive too for signal pronunciation. Just an image of transistors back to the circuit. And I'm going to just push right through all this because we kind of killed these topics. Um, and, and actually, this, this is a good thing to stop on to just for the benefit of, of your technical knowledge. Matt, a lower voltage frequency ratio results in a reduced motor flux, which would also reduce the motor torque. So essentially, it's like voltage starving an electric motor online power. Okay. So if you're down and you're starting up a pump, and for whatever reason, Amron's feeding you low power, instead of 460, it's at 430, or whatever stupid voltage you want to come up with then obviously the motor's not getting enough voltage excitation, it's gonna compensate in total current. And then a high volts per hertz ratio will oversatch, so, go ahead. So, so a low voltage input could cause that high, uh, 
overcurrent? Absolutely. Yes, sir. And so can a high. <laughs> so your, your voltage is very, very vital to the peculiarities of your electric motor. Your power supply, your incoming power supply, how you set up the drives, volts per hertz curve is, is critical for good motor. Well, it's a, it's a, it, I didn't think about that then. So, because if we do have a, an issue with a drive that's giving you an overcurrent error, technically you could have low voltage. Absolutely. A low voltage problem. You wouldn't think of that. You think you're getting high voltage or over voltage. It's it's okay. possible. Although the drive is pretty good, and, and what the inverter does is it's always looking at the DC bus voltage in the middle there, and it's evaluating. It's, it's got DC CTs, DC current transformers, so we're able to ascertain very precisely what we're looking at in the way of incoming voltage through the diodes by putting that CT right in the middle of the drive. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to protect ourselves. As a matter of fact, the values of tripping on the low voltage side for the drive really drop down low. But to your point, if I'm connected to a, a 230 volt motor winding and I've got 200 volts on the line side of the drive, you're exactly right. You're going to pull Well, it's a it. curious question because as we started coming up with the um, problem with the over voltage on the motors in California, I mentioned something in the fact that we are in California. Is the power coming to the building? Is it correct? Matt, that's a great question. Because I know that they the reduce time. that and they'll, they'll do those brownouts or rolling brownouts or everybody's air conditioners start up at 4 o'clock. Yep. And the plant always goes down at you know 4 o'clock and nobody can figure out why. Because they're not monitoring, because most buildings don't monitor the power coming in or check it. Okay. Yeah. Which at Miller Brothers, we ended up having to do down in. They had rural power and it was terrible. Mm -hmm. And they kept frying drives. Okay. And everybody was like, what's going on? What's going on? There's something wrong. And then finally, we got them to put in power monitoring. Yeah. And when they monitored the power, they realized it was just terrible. And they had to put in full conditioners on the building itself. Wow. Just, just to maintain good just voltage maintain. regulation. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Interesting. So, well, uh, although well, it's an interesting so correlation because I wouldn't have thought of looking at a motor overvolt and thinking I had low voltage coming in. So. Yeah. And, and let me encourage you on that line to motor or drive and motor for that matter, but drive protection itself is vital. And there's, in my judgment, with an incoming voltage power supply issue, and granted, I've, I've lost some drives when it's very severe, especially with extreme scenarios like voltage short circuits or lightning. But generally speaking, on utility service, a drive should protect itself from that. And you shouldn't have had to eat all those drives. If they're doing a good job of scanning, if, well, first off, do they have DCCTs? Do they scan those DCCTs accurately and rapidly within the guts of the drive? See, not all drives are not built equally. Correct. Uh, and this is what you're running into. Yeah, and this was a while. Uh, yeah, and I'm I, not going to age myself too much. But. No, you're good. No, I'm the oldest one here, and I love it. <laughs> I don't feel old at all. I ran a half a marathon a week and a half ago, I'll have nice. you know. So I'm I can't old. run a half marathon, so you're good. You, yeah, you could. could. You could. Do you, are you a runner too? All right, Austin, it was the, the, I'm out of breath going the marathon. The yeah. <laughs> half marathon marathon in St. Charles. The, the Mo, Mo Cowbell marathon. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Anyway, Rob ran that too. Yeah. Well, he walked it. He walked it. <laughs> <laughs> we digress. So here, here is the, uh, the, the specific range of the GA500, and it also gives you a feel for the form factor. They look a little different just because we like to allow, it, allow the drive terminals to be easily accessed, so that's why you see kind of a sweeping construction to the drive. And there's kits that you can buy to button up the drive to make them a Type 1 style drive. But this gives you an idea for what the GA500 platform actually looks like physically. 
Um, and this is just a couple key points. One would be the conformal coating that we use in the drives is an upgrade versus the older V1000. And, and for that matter, to my knowledge, many of our competitors, it's a 3C2 and 3S2, which just gives the drive a true uh, conformal coating uh, ambient protection to dust, gases, chemicals in the air. It's, it's a far more robust way of building printed circuit boards. Um, different types of motors can be controlled by the drives. There are safety rating inputs on the drive, so you could wire in a safety rated relay if you had to. I'll show you a little bit more on that in just a moment. We do meet all the global certifications, CE, UL, CUL, TUV. Short circuit capability of the drive is 31K, A, RMS, symmetrical. Um, and then I'm going to kind of bump through some of these slides and get to <clears throat> an exclamation point here. Um, get to, yeah. One, one of the features that we came up with in the GA500 and the GA800, which is kind of the big brother to the GA500, is this LED status ring. So if you open the door to your motor control center bucket, would it be convenient to scan down the line of drives that you had? You mentioned you have some applications for some, maybe 30 or whatever the number is. But the it, point, the it, point. It'd be more important, uh, I like the ring indicator because it, 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 for us it's a remote diagnosis usually, so you're usually talking with somebody that's not as familiar with these things. So easy indications that you can point to you know, they're going to open up a control cabinet, look at it, and see lights everywhere. And you can say, okay, you're looking for this white box that says Yaskawa. Right in the middle of it, there's a colored light. What color are all those lights? Exactly. Yeah. So and, and there's three. The blue light is, we're powered up. The green light is, we are actually putting voltage and current into the output. And the alarm error red portion of the LED indicator will either be solid if the drive is completely offline due to a fault, be it external or internal, or if it's flashing, that will tell you that there's a warning status. Mm -hmm. So what you just described is perfect. A yep. technician, a layman technician could open the door of the panel and look down whether it's four or 30 and say, well, everything's blue and green Except for one, hold it, let me yeah. go look. Oh, I got one here that's solid red. Okay, let's focus on that one. Yep. This is exactly what the LED status indicator allows you to do. Quick troubleshooting, quick startup, get your customer back online. Um, a tactile feel to the button. I know one of your engineers said, well, it kind of reminded me of a TI uh, calculator yeah. from the 1970s, and, and I'm not unsympathetic to that. I get it. <laughs> it is true. It's a true statement that he was a making. Here. Yes, the buttons actually go in and out. You can get a, a perspective of that just by looking at it. But the advantage of that we found versus the flat type of buttons is people like the tactile feel more than mm -hmm. they do the flat type of buttons. So I know it's Charlie. So probably yeah. <laughs> So it does remind us of a 1970s vintage calculator, but tactile feel is what we're going for. That way customers really know what they're doing when they're adjusting the keypad, okay? Um, and then the keypad is actually removable too. If you wanted to remote mount it, you could for whatever oh, okay. reason. But one other feature, which is on the bottom there, copy parameters. That means you can upload the parameters into the prom that's on the keypad and store the modified parameters of the drive CPU into the actual HIM, into the actual keypad. So then if a client had to swap out a drive in the field, he could remove the existing drive's keypad, put the new drive on the DIN, and then slap the original drive's keypad into the new drive, plug it in, and do a quick download. He has one window when he first powers the drive up to do a download. Otherwise, when you start reprogramming it, obviously you're going to forget what was in the EEPROM. You've got that one window to download what was in the EEPROM into the new drive. So it's a nice feature that many customers, many customers use. It, it looked like there was a USB port. Can you do that with like a little jump drive also? Yep, okay. you sure can, absolutely. 
And the same can be for if you you program one and you have you know eight in line, you can program the first one and then just drop that okay. program down. That's what I was saying. If you got the USB drive, you would probably just do that because yep. it'd be faster. But you could just take the the yeah. story up. And the, and what we typically do is our software. We have a software tool. It's free software called oh, Drive okay. Wizard. You, you download it from our website. Customers that have you know they have a program and they want us to preload it or something we can bring in here and obviously just open up the box, preload it, and then send it off. Um, well, it's something that we could save the drive program on our, and if the customer called up and gave it a new drive, I can just dump the drive, the program on it and ship. Yeah. And, and what Andrew is suggesting is very valuable because when you get this equipment in, a lot of times this is kind of the final exclamation point. You're building out the panels, you're laying yeah. it out. And so having that power systems give you the value added of managing your particular programs for your hardware kind of takes your operators out of that whole issue. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you've still got the files, don't yeah, get me yeah, wrong. Yeah. But you've said, okay, now pre-program our drives and here's what we want. And boom, well, they can you know, really maybe help improve your productivity and efficiency and you know, one less thing for your people to have to worry about doing. Anyway, and then as I had mentioned, we can run different types of electric motors, permanent magnet. Have you, have you ever gotten into synchronous reluctance motors, permanent magnet motors, different mounting configurations? So I, I can't even get them now. Yeah, <laughs> what, motors? Yeah. yeah. Right. No, I hear you. Actually, I quoted a bunch of motors, about $20,000 worth yesterday while I was here. And, uh, and we use Marathon as our motor source or motor supplier, oh. and they were at two weeks, which I was like, wow, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's it's pretty insanely short, short actually. Motors, yeah. Yeah. And something under six weeks is amazing. So maybe we'll get that one. Yeah. <laughs> so you can see, do you use, do you use DIN rail mounting yeah. for your drives? So yeah, we're DIN rail mountable, so that's good. You can stack them side by side if you got into any type of panel constraint issues with your spacing. Mm -hmm. You can work around that. And I think I had mentioned there's a, a V1000 4X, but there's also a Type 1 IP20 enclosure kit that buttons up the drive, and it looks like that. Okay. So that's another thing. And this just kind of gets into different frame sizes and variants, which have watt loss data. Actually, the watt loss data is an area map. When it comes to efficiency in our semiconductors and in our design, our, our just the integrity of design in terms of the amount of heat that the heat sink is putting off or the internal components that the drive is putting off, and that's what you see by the internal and external references. In the industry of drives, I, I don't think, I, I mean, I haven't studied every model and make out there, but from what I know after 30 plus years, we're the best in this area. Watt generation and keeping the heat loss down on equivalent KW, the equivalent carrier frequency, because the switch rate of those semiconductors affects how much heat yep. they're going to put off. Uh, so, all things being equal. Well, this, and then in turn, the heat this, uh, affects the switch rate. <laughs> you got it. Yes, sir. Yeah. And that's why our, oh. our design integrity is you know, not that good. That's why I work for you, Scott, instead of Rockwell to be candid with you. I mean, it's just been a good good quality product. I love to sell it. I could make a lot more money working for the other guys, but I choose not to because I know what, I'm, what I represent here. 24 volt DC is available on these drives. So if you wanted to get into a scenario where you could lock out, take out the panel, source from Andrew here, 24 volt DC supply to light up your drives, your processor, your HMI, you're completely locked out, tagged out, and now you just close the 24 volt DC and you can troubleshoot, program, your ethernet's online, everything is online with an external 24 volt DC. So this drive has that as standard, mm -hmm. built in. So, so basically it would just, it would output to the motor, but the motor's not gonna obviously be powered, so. Right. Correct. So we're, we're kind of dry running it. Yeah, and, and, and you really, I mean, technically with 24 volt DC lighting up the front end of the drive, there, there would be no voltage present on the output side of the drive. It would just be internal on the processor of the drive. The keypad would be lit. Yeah. The Ethernet right. board LED would be flashing. But you're right, though. If you got into powering up the drive, 
with main three phase and you were jacking around with the output wire, even though you're not running, it's, it's not necessarily the safest thing to be doing because yeah. you can yeah. find stray voltages on those conductors. <laughs> yeah, so as you probably well know. Different cards are available, obviously your Ethernet, IP, so they all, the form factor is the same and notice the bump out. So this is what your coworker had put together on the drives. And, and candidly, I want you to be aware, this is something that would be done either here at NAF for your drives where we would install this card, or you could do it yourself. But installing this card on the drive is required. And that's unlike the PowerFlex 525 where you've already got it residing in the drive. So this is a difference. Okay. And, and you could say it's a little bit of a disadvantage, but you know, that's just the Ethernet so cards. Every time, yeah. Yeah. Just mounts on the front end of the drive, but that's something to just kind of keep in mind. <clears throat> we kind of tend to order kitted items anyway. Yeah. Even with like the six stuff, we, we buy them. He's got kind of a rock. kit. When it comes <laughs> to kit, everything for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> these guys rock it. I mean, it's yeah. one thing having been in the warehouse and learned how NAF power goes to market. That's just a core competency of, of, of this place. I mean, it's it's beneficial. Yeah. I don't need to I don't need to know every little part I need to order. I just need to I know what I need. Tell Andrew what I need, and he puts the kit. And, yeah, yeah. I think all your your sick stuff. I I don't even know if you guys know how many part numbers are in the one part number you order. I don't even yeah. want to know. Yeah, I, just, yeah. I get a box of parts and I put it together. <laughs> yeah. Six twenty kit, perfect. Yep. And, you know they're there. and if they're not all there, Andrew, get your butt over here. Yeah. I'm missing a part. I have the whole breakout, but you, it's one part number to you guys. <laughs> yeah. Right. So there is a safety rated relay capability in this drive, and, and all that that means is we've got dedicated contacts that are jumpered out. As a matter of fact, you may have noticed them on some of the images. So it's a dedicated to the safety, which we do safety, a safety relay. So. Beautiful. And you can daisy chain on our drive if you need to daisy chain the commons and the H1H2. It is SL3, so it's two inputs. And we do have answer back capability so that if one of them were to open or both were to open, we can answer back with either a digital output or obviously via RS logics okay. to tell you, hey, we have a external. So your H1 and H2 are two separate circuits. So yes. Common. H1. So one common. There's one and then common. H1, H2, HC. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Exactly right. Matter of fact, um, yesterday I brought in what we call our cheat sheets, and they corresponded with the GA500. <laughs> uh, and then they were all absconded with by mainly NEF employees. <laughs> to grab them up. But I do have the big brother for the GA500. It's called the GA800 circuit and as it relates to the safety circuit it's exactly the same and for the most part the digital inputs the digital outputs you'll notice it's exactly right you got it there's two jumpers connecting those again all the inputs are on the left all the outputs are on the right and this would be the ga 800 a few more digital outputs um, a few a little bit more flexibility on the 800 being kind of like the like the big brother to the micro drive, the GA500 being a micro drive category product. And you're saying you have the ability to basically go from drive to drive, so H1 to H1 to H1. Yeah. And we, we see that done. Come. Yeah, we'll just say I see that done a fair amount. I'm not going to comment on what the local inspector might say about it, but I'm going to tell you that it works. Okay. Typically, so, what well, best practice would be to run them all back to a jumper block, terminal yeah. block. And yeah, I would do that. Which is most likely what we would do. And, and just like you can see here with a safety monitoring relay, you know, typically a orange or red painted relay wired into that circuit. But is it, it, it's a, the, that's nice enough that we do try to make sure we're we actually taking these mm -hmm. UL. You know, guys. So. You're welcome to keep that if you oh. like. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to dump paper on you, but I was going to give you a brochure on the GA502 before you leave. But let, let me just kind of wrap this up. Mm -hmm.